Hi, my name is Nancy Osterberg. I'm from the New Jersey Agricultural Society Learning Through Gardening Program. I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about some basic gardening. First, a little bit about me is that I'm a retired educator. I worked at an elementary school for 33 years. I retired last June. Um, so now I'm working with the New Jersey Agricultural Society. I'm so happy to be with you today. Um, after I retired, you know, one of the things that I always loved doing before I retired was gardening. And then I um, decided to become a master gardener. And as I was starting to, you know, explore those options, I um, found this job with the New Jersey Agricultural Society. And I feel really um, lucky that I found this position where I get to marry two of my loves together, my love of gardening and my love of teaching. Um, so today I'm just going to go over some gardening basics from planning your garden to managing your classroom in the garden. Um, please feel free to jot down any questions, shoot me an email after this is over um, and let me know what you think or if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to um, answer them. Um, anyone who knows me well knows that I answer my emails super quick. So um, let me get ready to share my screen with you so we can get started. Do I want to share that? There we go. Okay. So as I said, let me move myself. As I said, we're going to talk today um, a little bit about some gardening basics. You know, first I wanted to talk about, you know, everyone can garden. Um, sometimes I hear people say that I have a brown thumb or I'm not really good at gardening or I'm not good with plants, but really um, that's just not the case. Gardening really can be for everyone and it's a lot of fun. Um, you don't need any special skills to be able to garden. Um, you just need some resilience and some, um, you know, sometimes it doesn't always work out the way that you want it, but it's okay because you can always try again. But for me, I find gardening to be um, a very enjoyable pastime. I find it gets me away from the my everyday worries and it gets me away from my screens. And I just enjoy being out in the sunshine amongst my plants and my flowers. And you know, I just highly suggest this hobby for everyone. The gardens that we um, provide through the Learning Through Garden, the gardens and the plants, really our primary focus is that they are food production gardens. We really are so, um, we so want our, the children to learn about growing plants, how plants grow, where they're grown, you know, the effort that goes into growing plants. But we also want them to realize, you know, that there's a lot of different plants. Um, we want them to be able to, you know, try new things. So, you know, while our focus is on growing and harvesting food, you know, your food production garden that you make at your school can really be anything more to more in addition to just food production. You know, we're making a garden classroom, so it's going to be a teaching garden. You know, by nature, I think gardens in general are all sensory gardens. There's so much to see and to hear and to touch and to taste. So I think, you know, just by nature, it goes along with that. Um, one of the first things you need to consider is where you're going to put your garden. These are the, the considerations. You need, you need um, at least six hours of sunlight daily accessibility to water source. You gotta think about pests, not just insects um, and like we normally think about, but deer and other animals, maybe bunnies even, and accessibility. You want your garden to be placed in a place where it's easy to get to, where it's not forgotten, you know, long, far, you know, long and far away. You want it to be there so, oh, there's the garden, I gotta get out there, I gotta get out and go do it. Sometimes, you know, the phrase out of sight, out of mind, comes into play and you know if we're not thinking about something, we forget about it. So these are the four um, things that we should really think about when you're deciding where to place your garden. Now, most of you, your gardens have already been placed, right? That decision has already been made. But now we think, let's think about planning when we're planning our garden and planning is going to be one of the most important things that you do as you incorporate your school garden. One of the things I want you to make sure that you think about is crop rotation. And what that means is it means that you can't plant the same crop in the same um, raised bed each year. Um, you have to plan that you're going to be moving um, them around. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, you know, it minimizes disease. Sometimes um, certain plants carry certain diseases. And if you keep planting the, the um, same plant in the same soil year after year, it's going to perpetuate that disease. And, you know, if it's a disease that's, you know, that prefers leafy plants, let's say, then if you keep planting your leafy plants there, they're not going to stand a chance. 
Um, this also helps to minimize insect infestation, again, similar to the soil, you know, some insects like certain plants. Um, it also replenishes nutrients. You know, the plants take different nutrients from the soil. Different plants, just like, you know, different plants need different things from the soil and they take different nutrients. So by rotating them, it helps to replenish those, um, those nutrients that we find in the soil. And really, hopefully you have four, you know, different boxes. Eventually you'll have six, but you're going to plan that you, you don't plant the same crop in the same box for four years. So it's a four year rotation. Um, let me move myself here. Here's just another example of what a crop rotation might look like. This is an example for, you know, this is for a three year rotation with, with three beds. Is it ideal? No, four year, four, you know, a four year rotation is best, but this certainly would work as well. You can see they've got tomatoes, legumes, which are beans and carrots, and then they just rotate them around year after year. Um, just like there's things that we need to know about our gardening space before we begin, there's specific things we need to know before we start growing certain plants. Just because we like the way a certain plant tastes or the way a certain plant might look doesn't mean it's going to do well in our garden. So before you're planting certain plants, you need to learn about those plants. You need to learn about the sun requirements that they have. How many hours of sunlight do they need a day? You need to find out how much space they need to grow. Different plants need to be spaced different distances apart. Um, you need to find out if they're container friendly or maybe they're not container friendly. And even though, you know, certain plants, you know, will not grow well in a raised garden bed, depending on what it is. So you really need to find out, you know, if you're, um, what you're planting is container friendly. You need to know the age to maturity from the time that you plant it from seed to when you can expect harvested. And this, that is going to be something that's going to be especially important to you as you're planning your school gardens. And then you also need to take into consideration the water needs. Does it require a lot of water? Does it require not, you know, does it not require very much water? You know, different plants have different, you know, needs. Um, this is so important for, you know, for you as your um, planning your gardens, you know, we're talking about what plants need, how will you know? And I keep, and I said on the previous slide to read about them. Well, you can see on the back of this carrot um, package here, it gives you a whole description. It tells you what kind of light it needs. It gives you the timing of it, you know, when it should be sown, when you should plant those seeds. It tells you what kind of soil you need. It tells you how deep to plant those seeds. And then it gives you information about the care of those plants. And it tells you that it's ready to harvest in 70 days. You know, there's so much information on the back. I think sometimes, myself included, I get carried away by looking at the picture on the front. That's the plant I want. I forget to turn it over to look to see if this is a plant that's going to be good for me and good for my garden. And, and it will be good for it. You know, like, will, will it grow there? So, so important to take a notice of those directions on the back of the seed packet. You know, we, let me move myself again. I'm kind of in the way. Where am I? Ah, oops, hang on, I'm sorry. Hang on, back, there we go. Okay, talking about the growing zones in New Jersey. Now, um, very often when you buy plants or sometimes in different seed packets, you know, I just showed you that one, they're not all exactly the same. Sometimes they talk about um, zones and zones where different plants can grow. Now, New Jersey, you can see on this map is represented here. New Jersey is zone six and then zone seven. Um, the more northern part of New Jersey is that darker green. It's up at the top, up in Sussex County, you can see is all um, six, actually it's six A. They even split it up. This uh, map is even a little bit more detailed because it split it up. It took uh, zone six and then it divided it into six A and six B and six B is that lighter green. And then we have zone seven and they split that up as well. Zone seven is seven A, which is, oh, I don't even know what color I would say that is. And then seven B is like a little, little there's a little peach in that. And if you look down at Cape May, um, down at the bottom of Cape May County, you can see where that peach color is. But those zones really tell you the, the temperature, um, how cold the average temperature is. That's not saying that it not, it's not ever gonna get colder than that. We all know that sometimes we have those cold snaps, 
but that's just, you know, that's the, you know, the average, right? The climates, those are those averages, that's the, those, those temperatures that they use are the average temperatures. You know, sometimes we could potentially have a very cold winter that gets so cold that something that, you know, supposed to live in zone six may not make it because it got really cold. But, you know, those, you know, those types of things can happen. Um, so New Jersey, we're zone six up in the north and zone seven down in the southern part of New Jersey, generally. But again, you can see this map, you know, um, if you can't see the colors, great. You know, I just Googled this. So you can Google it and you can find exactly, you know, where your town is to find exactly what your temperatures, um, your minimum temperatures are. And these minimum temperatures are important for um, things more like perennials than anything and perennials are those plants that come back year after year. So zone six, zone six was that more northern part of New Jersey. And again, this is something that you can look up, but it gives you a general idea of your planting schedule. Of your planting schedule. It says when the plants are growing, when you can plant them, and then when you can expect to harvest them. And then the same is true. I have another one here. And this is the same, this is for zone seven. Similar, a little bit different. You can see in zone seven, we're a little bit warmer. We can start some of those things, you know, a little bit sooner and um, our growing season is just a little bit longer because it stays warmer here longer. But again, both of these, um, as far as these, these zone planting schedules, these are things that you can easily find online. If you can't find them, just reach out to me and I'd be happy to send you um, a copy of what your zone planting schedule would look like. So let's talk a little bit about cool season crops and warm season crops. Cool season crops are those crops that we can plant early in the spring. They prefer the cool weather. In the heat of the summer, they're not really growing anymore. Generally, those are those roots, the stem and the leaf. Um, in the, um, you know, sometimes these plants can overwinter. They can, they can make it over the winter time. Um, sometimes, again, depending on the type of winter that we have. So those roots, um, leaves, and, um, oh, actually, I think that, that second statement is not quite right. Generally, it's the root, and it should be the root and the um, leaf not the stem and the flower bud crop. So I have to fix that, I apologize. Um, those warm um, season crops, they're those, you know, those warm weather um, things, those warm weather crops that we see. Uh, corn, tomatoes, right? In the heat of the summer, when we're getting those things, those are those summertime crops. They need that hotter weather. They're not going to perform. They're not going to get ready. They're not going to bloom without it, okay? We plant those warm season crops. My rule of thumb, and I got this from my grandmother from many years ago, I always still always plant my garden, my vegetable garden my, with my summer veggies in it um, on Mother's Day. So that's when I plant my, you know, after, or, you know, Mother, Mother's Day is usually always my day, but, um, you know, right around then in May, because, you know, it's warm enough then for those plants. Now, as far as you're going, um, you know, we're in school, you're planting fall and spring gardens, right? So for those types of gardens, we're not gonna be able to plant those, those vegetables like that. So you're gonna be planting lots of, lots of leafy grains, you know, things like there's all different kinds of lettuce um, seeds that I'm gonna be giving you, um, kale, uh, uh, endive, spinach, those types of things. So you can plant these types of seeds really close together. Um, you're also gonna get some seed plugs and plugs are just those little plants that you're gonna get plant them along with the seeds. So I'll send some plugs of some lettuce and some different leafy grains that you can plant together. Um, when your seeds start to sprout, if you see some large gaps, you can always sprinkle some more seeds. These leafy um, vegetables, they're one of the few ones, and I, later on I'll say don't overcrowd your um, plants, but the leafy ones can really stay pretty close together and you can get it, you can really do some nice coverage. If it looks like it's too close and like things are, ch are choking out, you can always pluck some of them out, but don't be afraid with those leafy greens, plant them, plant lots of, of those seeds together. You can, you know, quadrant out your garden and, you know, give each student like a little square and they can sprinkle the seeds in that little square. So that would be one way. Um, something else I want to encourage you to do is to experiment with roots. We don't eat nearly enough root vegetables in my opinion. 
Um, there's so many, you know, we think of carrots always, right? But radishes, kohlrabi, rutabaga, beets, turnips, and parsnips. My personal favorite are parsnips. Love them, love them, delicious. Um, but really, you know, a lot of these, a lot of um, your students may, may never even have had any of these types of vegetables. So really you wanna to try to plant them and um, that way you can harvest them and give the, the students a chance to try them. Remember, if they've grown them themselves, they're gonna be more likely to wanna to at least take a no thank you bite um, so again, again, that's one of our goals. We want them to try new um, vegetables and things. Roots are nice because um, they can be harvested as late as December, depending on what the weather is like. You know, we've had, um, you know, sometimes we can go as late as December. If you're careful and you baby them, you might even to be, be able to go um, a little bit longer than that. So um, don't be afraid of root vegetables. Um, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if you try them. Um, now, here are some other cool season vegetables, you know, in addition to the roots that we were just talking about. You know, again, you know, depending on what your timing looks like, you can decide um, when you would like to try to grow some of these things. Um, these ones have a little bit of a longer season, so you might want to put these in your spring garden rather than in your fall garden. Um, you know, get back to school in September, you have to count the number of weeks you have for something to mature. So you might not have, you know, 14 weeks, you know, from the beginning of school till, you know, November for your broccoli to mature. But if you get right on the stick and you wanna do broccoli um, in the springtime, you'll have some time for it to mature so that the students can, you know, eat the um, vegetables that they're growing prior to leaving. And remember, that's our goal. We want the students who plant the vegetables to be the ones who get to enjoy the fruits of their labor. That, that's, that's hopefully our goal um, through learning through gardening. But you can see there's, you know, onions are interesting and I'll bring them up again um, later, but onions might be an interesting thing to try to plant. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, as I was saying on the previous side, when it gets to be fall gardening time, it's really short, it goes fast. You know, it's only seven to eight weeks long, you know, especially, you know, that's if you can get in your garden right away. You know, and I know the beginning of the school year has got so many other things going on, but really it's so important if you're going to plant, you know, depending, depending on what you're going to plant, let me say, um, that you planted in enough time. Again, that's why it's so important to know that harvest time, right? How many days it is to maturity, how many days it is until you get that harvest. So fall gardens, you know, probably those leafy veggies, there's our, some of our leafies, beets, bok choy, cabbage, collards, kale. Beets are not a leafy though. Beets should be in the roots. So, oh, hang on, I'm sorry. It keeps automatically advancing on me. Um, and I think spinach and um, beets somehow got flipped there. So I'll have to fix that next time. So I apologize for that. Um, but again, you know, Leafy and roots in the spring and the fall gardens. Those are the ones that you want to stick with. You know, you might want to try growing garlic. Garlic might be something fun to grow. Um, you can make garlic bread maybe with this kids with the garlic after you make it. But you can plant garlic in late November. So when the garden's starting to wind down, garlic is something you can do. You can, you know, um, sometimes I know if I don't use my garlic right away, it starts to grow a little bit. And you can plant those bulbs that are starting to grow. Or if you want, you know, if, you know, you can um, go to the grocery store and just get those organic bulbs from the grocery store. You can plant them, they, they will grow. Or you can send away for, you know, um, you know, from a seed place to get garlic to grow as well. But the nice thing about garlic is you can plant garlic around the edges of your garden. And that helps to, as a natural pesticide. Um, pests don't really like the smell of garlic and they kind of stay away from it. So, you know, it's a great, you know, kind of a double, double-edged sword for that. And then you can harvest your um, garlic in June when the stalks are yellow, that's when you pull it out and there you go. And then you can always um, save some garlic, you know, save some of them and for the next planting season. Okay, let's talk a little bit about summer vegetable gardens. These are those warm season crops. You know, um, 
we talked about them a little bit, tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplant, zucchini, you know, all of those things that I know that I typically um, think about when I'm growing, when I'm, when I'm thinking about summer gardens in New Jersey. Um, one of the things that I, I can't stress enough is weeding. Uh, weeds, just make sure you stay on top of it because weeds have an incredible way of multiplying and growing so quickly. So really you want to make sure you stay on top of the weeds, have the kids help you weed. They can, get, can give everyone a little area just that way they can just all pull the weeds. You know, many hands make light work, but you really don't want your weeds to get really big. You don't want them to, you know, develop, they develop some monster roots sometimes. And it's almost, it's really hard sometimes to get them out when they've established themselves. But even worse, you know, because some weeds are perennials, they'll come back year after year after year, right? But other ones, um, you know, those annual ones, you don't want them to go either because you don't want them to go to seed and then reseed themselves and then they'll come back year after year. So just stay on top of your weeds. Um, something we're gonna talk about some things that we can do to help with weed control. Mulch, mulch is really important. Mulch can do a couple of things. It can help you with your weed control. If you put some, a layer of mulch down, and it's also good for water conservation. It helps hold that moisture in so that the, you know, the ground doesn't just, you know, sometimes the soil will just dry out so quickly. When it's got mulch on top of it, it helps to hold that, um, that moisture in. You know, so I put a couple of things here. You know, sometimes you can, you know, if you have a local tree service company, they can give you some, you know, wood chips. You can put them on the paths of the garden. Um, sometimes, you know, it depends, you know, where you're getting your wood. Sometimes your local, your, your local municipality, excuse me, will have some mulch that they can donate as well. But it's really, you know, it really help. It's really helpful for plants. Something else that plants need is that they need water. So you need to make sure that, you know, if you have an irrigation system, yay, 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 yay. Um, but you know, you need to really make sure that your plants are getting enough water. Um, you know. We always make sure that you have, you know, a spigot nearby, but water is, you know, vital to a plant's growth. Um, something you can do, we're talking about our summer gardens now. Um, and I just, um, I didn't read this book ever, but I just thought he was cute when I Googled, uh, was looking for something for a picture for uh, garden, gar uh, garden Guardian. This little book came up. I have to find it and read it and I'll let you know if it's any good. But basically, um, you know, have, you know, people in your neighborhood, parents of students sign up to adopt a garden space in the summertime. That way the garden doesn't get out of control. They can weed, they can water, they can harvest vegetables. Um, you know, hopefully you can get someone to cover each week of the summer um, or, you know, however you want, you know, summer in the morning, summer in the afternoon, you know, making a schedule, um, would be something that would be really helpful. And it's exciting because the kids do like to um, go back to school in the summertime. No one's there, it's exciting. Like, well, I wonder what's going on at school. You know, they, um, I know that when my children were young, they had a garden at their school and we always used to volunteer every summer to take a week to go water the garden and, and take care of it. And it was always a very exciting week for my kids. So, I mean, just an idea. Um, in case you wanted to do something like that. Um, you know, again, before you leave at the end of the school year, you can start thinking about the fall. You can plant some, um, plant some vegetables for the fall. Again, you have to read that days till harvest on the back of the seed packages and plan, count backwards. Um, your students in, in, can plant um, at the very end of June. They can, might be able to plant some corn and be able to come back and have it um, back when they get back to school. If someone's watering the garden all summer long, but again, there's 90 to 100 day corn and then there's 65 day corn. So that's where it gets so important. You know, we talk about reading and planning and that's what I'm talking about as far as, you know, trying to make, make sure you stay organized with that. Also, you know, lots of vegetables, they have to be harvested um, to keep producing throughout the summer. If you're not taking the, you know, the, the fruit that's ready off of the plant, it's going to stop producing because all of the plant's energy, sorry, all of the plant's energy and nutrients are going towards um, keeping that, you know, feeding that fruit. Once you take the fruit away, 
then it's got that additional energy that it can go to start making more fruit. So it's important in the summer, um, to, you know, to make sure that you're harvesting as things become ripe. You don't want to just leave it on the vine and say, oh, I'll get them, you know, I'll get it when I have a lot. That's not the way a garden will work for you. Um, something else um, for a summer garden, you know, if you're not growing plants in the garden, you can um, do a cover crop and a cover crop is basically just something to cover it, cover the um, bed, because if you don't cover the bed with something, with some sort of crop or some sort of plant, what's going to happen? Weeds are going to grow because wherever there's a spot in the soil, in the, in the soil, something is going to want to grow something. There's going to be a seed. There's, there's something that's going to be it's going to want to grow. So um, I did put in here a little bit of information about growing buckwheat. If that's something that you're interested in, um, then you can use it, um, you know, to, you know, to help build the soil. So, uh, and there's some directions about what to do if you decide to do a summer crop. Um, I'm not sure buckwheat is one of those things. It'd be a little bit, you know, Again, it'd be an experiment for sure. I've never personally, let me go back. I've never really done this. I did read about this. This is just a suggestion. I don't know in your summer beds if you wanna go with buckwheat, um, but I would think that growing something like buckwheat would be better than just leaving it you know, with nothing in it at all. Okay, talking about our summer gardens. Here are some things that you might wanna try. They might be ready again, if someone is there to take care of them during the summer. You can't just plant them in June and then have a harvest. And I guess my title for the slide is a little bit misleading because it makes, you know, makes it seem like you'll be able to have these when you come back to school in September. You can for sure. However, you've gotta make sure that someone's taking care of this garden in the summer. We know that the garden is going to need water and it's going to need other care, you know, weeding, harvesting during the summer or else it's not going to sustain. But these are just some summer crops that you can be planted, that can be planted in your um, summer garden as well. Okay, so let's talk about, um, we've talked about things that we can grow and planting our garden. So let's talk about now how to do things. Let's, um, you know, planting seeds. This is um, how you can plant seeds before you plant. You can, you know, scrape off, you know, the top layer of soil in your raised bed, and then you can, you know, draw a rectangle or lines of where you want them. Sometimes I've seen people quadrant them off, um, and then you can have the children, you can mark them off where you want them, I'm sorry, to plant the seeds. Be careful though, if the soil is really dry, you might want to moisten the soil a little bit before you go planting your seeds. And the reason for this is if it's dry and you're scraping off that top layer, you know, a gust of wind blows, it helps the seeds stick to the soil better. So you want, you know, you want the seeds to stay down. You don't want them to get blown away by um, an unexpected gust of wind. So if you moisten that soil, it really helps that. So don't just plant on that dry soil. If it, it won't, it, it won't be great. Um, when you're planting with kids, you can see, you can, you know, put, you can put a small number of seeds in the palm of their hand and then have them take a pinch and then sprinkle, okay? And they can take a fistful of soil out of that bucket that you, remember the bucket we scraped off? They take a fistful of that soil and then they sprinkle it on top. Most seeds, when you're reading them, you have to, again, it, it goes, it's different from, you know, seed variety to seed variety, anywhere between an eighth and a half inch of soil. Usually we don't plant seeds much deeper than a half an inch. And then after they sprinkle the soil back on, then they gently pat it down. Sometimes with really small children, you know, those little tiny seeds might be too much for them. They might not have the dexterity to pinch those ones. So you might wanna save those bigger seeds for the smaller kids to plant. But that depends, you know, it depends on, you know, what your plan is that goes back to that planning piece. Um, the next slide is about seeds expiring. You know, seeds do have dates on them. They sell, they're sold for this season or that season. Um, you know, it's not really an expiration date, you know, so you can plant seeds usually two to three years 
you know, after that date that's on there on the package. After that, I might not plant them. Um, you know, if you've got seeds that are two or three years old, you might want to plant a little extra seed, you know, a few more than you might, you know, you might, if they were, you know, that season seed, but they're not, you know, it's not like, oh, they're, you know, they're rotten, they go bad. Um, really much older seeds, you know, um, I don't really know. I haven't done a lot of studies on that, but you can save them. I wouldn't get rid of them. I would save them for different um, experiments in class. You can, you know, you can see there's, you know, what fraction you can have them plant them and see what fraction actually germinates or doesn't germinate or something like that. You can use them for sorting activities. So there's a lot of different things that you can use them for. Um, you'll be receiving some plant plugs and plant plugs are just really small little um, plants, um, little seedlings. Um, keep their roots wrapped in wet paper towels until you're ready to plant them. Don't just count on the, um, the plant plugs, especially for your leafies. Um, don't just plant the plug, plant some other things in addition to them, okay? And when students are planting those plugs, encourage them to use their hands to work with the soil. You know, we really want the, we want the students to be touching the soil. Um, the soil that we provide you, with you um, through the learning through gardening, there's nothing bad with, there's nothing, there's no diseases in it, there's nothing like that. Um, you know, I sometimes some kids, have never touched it before, have never touched soil. So you really wanna give them that opportunity to get their hands dirty. There's no reason for children to um, wear gloves um, when they're gardening um, because we want them to have that experience. Um, this next slide is probably one of my favorites because it's about companion planting. And um, I like this, I do this a lot in my own garden and it's really about planting different plants together and they help one another, they're companions and they, they either, you know, they do something, they, they benefit one another. So you can mix, you know, it's about mixing things together, not just a vegetable garden, but some vegetables and some herbs or some vegetables and some flowers. And the goal of planting things together is because sometimes, you know, it can, it can attract or repel different insects. Um, sometimes they help each other replenish different nutrients in the soil that the, you know one you know takes this and the other one provides that to the soil, whatever nutrient it might be. Um, you know, beneficial insects. You know, not all insects are bad. Not all insects are created equally. So, you know, it gives them a habitat um, to live. We want to we want to encourage those good um, insects into our gardens. They help us. They help pollinate. They help do a lot of things. So we don't want our gardens to be bug free. Um, so what you can do is you can plant these, these are called, they're trap crops and they lure the insects away from the vegetables. So rather than eating my um, vegetables, I can um, you know, plant some other things. For example, like if I've got a problem with flea beetles, I can plant radishes, nasturtiums and mustard. The aphids like the nasturtium too. Slugs and thrips like marigolds. So if you have a problem with marigolds, you can, I mean, not a problem with marigolds, if you have a problem with slugs, marigolds may be, um, may be naturally helpful to you. And cabbage worms, you can plant sage, radish, and collards. And again, I put on this slide about planting onions and garlic among, the, um, among your vegetables because insects don't like them. So you can get some, gar you know, some, um, um, garlic bulbs like we were talking about before. The same is true for onions. You know, you don't have to go and get some special onion seeds. Either the onions grow from a bulb. So if you've got some onion bulbs that are not looking great, bring them into school and throw them in the garden, see what happens. You know, it's a, you know it can be an experiment. Herbs are also good for um, attracting good insects and, and repelling the bad. Some herbs that are easy to grow from seed, basil, chives, dill, oregano, thyme, and cilantro. Um, rosemary and parsley, a little bit more difficult to grow um, from seed, but you know, rosemary, once it gets established, that's a perennial that will come back. It's a little, it's a bush and it, it will, you know, it's, it's really nice. It's, it has a lovely fragrance, you know, talking, going back to that sensory piece, right? Um, so perennial herbs for zone six and seven, meaning that they'll come back year after year. So once you get them established, you know, barring the fact that unless we have, you know, a really horrendous winter, thyme, rosemary, lavender, and oregano, all of them will all come back year after year. So um, those of you who are interested in planting some herbs in your garden, 
those are nice ones, again, because they don't have to be replanted year after year. And again, I, you're probably thinking, what about um, crop rotation? For your perennial herbs, you might wanna have a garden that's perennial herbs and you wouldn't have to move them year after year as far as when we were talking about crop rotation. But again, this goes back to you know, planning your garden. What do you wanna plant? Where do you wanna plant it? And having, you know, having a specific plan um, idea. So you wanna make sure you have enough, you know, enough um, boxes to, to rotate to rotate your crops, right? But also if you wanna have some, um, some of your raised gardens that have perennials, so you'll have to um, factor that in as you're planning what, you're, planning what your garden's going to be. Um, flowers, my personal favorite, they're great they, to attract um, beneficial insects, bees and things like that we need for pollination. Um, some easy to grow marigolds from seeds, marigolds, morning glories, zinnias, sunflowers, Nasturtium, those are, they've got these um, edible flowers. Um, I've never really, I've never grown Nasturtium, but my sister has, and I was at her house once and the beautiful orange flowers they have. And you eat them, they've got like a, a peppery taste to them. They're really interesting. Um, I would be careful if you're thinking about um, growing some of these annuals, um, they're all lovely. Um, the one I would be careful of is morning glories because morning glories um, can easily get out of hand. They start receding themselves. They go everywhere. They can become kind of weed-like very quickly if you're not careful. Um, so just be careful of morning glories. But the, you know, what's nice about planting, um, you know, flowers in your garden is because, you know, most of our gardens we're talking, well, they need wide open space. They need all of this light. Um, so you know, oh, I'm sorry, Hang on. it keeps automatically advancing, I'm sorry. Um, you know, so when you've got your garden in that wide open space, it's great for the sunlight, but it's not great because you're not getting a lot of those beneficial insects. So it's nice to have those flowers because those flowers are what draws those insects into your garden. Did I skip one? Hang on. No, okay, sorry about that. Okay. Um, Watering plants. This goes for your outside plants and your inside plants. When should I water my plants? You have to water your plants when they're dry, no matter what kind, no matter what, again, whether they're inside or outside, especially when they're young. Young plants require more water. They need to get established. But, you know, you can't really, there's no rule of thumb like, oh, I water my plants once a week. And you can't really do that because um, plants need water when they need water. When they're dry, they need water. So you can't, you can't say, oh, they're gonna be dry in a week. They might not be dry in a week or they might be too dry. They might be dry in three days. So you can't really have a set rule. You've got to really pay attention to your plants and water them when they need it. Um, something that you can make easily for your um, school gardens, you can use a, a recycled milk jug um, and have those some very small holes in the bottom, fill it up and then it will slow, give a slow um, irrigation for your garden. You might want to, you could always leave them in and they could, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I was trying to think of an easy way to get them filled. I was thinking about, um, you know, leaving them in almost as a, uh, you know, something to catch rain, but I'm not sure that that would work. I have to experiment with that a little bit more. Um, garden maintenance. We're talking about things that need to happen in the garden to keep it, to keep it growing. These are things that need to happen all through the season. Um, plants need to be thinned. You need to weed. You need to water. You need to prune things, cut them back. Sometimes trellises need to be built. Certain plants need to grow in a trellis. They're viney, they need to go up. Um, perhaps peas, if you're growing some peas, some beans, not all beans, but some beans need trellises. Um, your garden needs to be harvested. You need to watch out for diseases and pests. That's why it's so important to spend time in your garden. You wanna um, you know, make sure you're looking at your plants, making sure they're staying healthy. And then you've got your yearly maintenance for you know, garden upkeep. You know, all those things, your pathways and your, you know, hoses and all of that other stuff. There's lots of, in the, the, the beds themselves sometimes. So there's lots of, there's lots of things. There's always something to do in the garden. You know, um, our work is never done. Okay, we're finally at the point where we can talk about harvesting. What can I do? I've harvested my garden. What can I do? Well, there's a couple of things, a couple of ideas that I have. Maybe you've got some more ideas. I would love to hear them. 
One thing you can do is have a salad party. So when we talked about having a whole four by eight raised box of greens, right? Of lettuces and different types of um, lettuces and kohlrabi and kale and all those other things that we were talking about before. You can just harvest them and have a salad party. Invite as many people as you can, right? You wanna invite the community members, show them what you grew. The kids would be so proud of themselves and encourage the kids to, to try the different types of lettuces. Um, I, would be, I would warn you, just you know, be careful when you're having your salad party. Um, salad dressing is nice, but I would try to go the route without the salad dressing because we really want the students to um, taste the fresh um, vegetables, you know, the way that they, the way that they are naturally. Um, if you've had your, you've, you still have more, um, things that you've harvested from your garden, you can have students bring home the extras. They can, you know, they can go home and they can tell their parents, you know, how they grew that squash or how, you know, what they did, you know, what their part was in growing this beet, or maybe even introduce their family to a vegetable that they've never, that no one in the family has had before. And then maybe they'll decide as a family, wow, this is something that we want to add to our repertoire. Wow, you know, beets really are delicious. You know, they've got just gotten a bad rap over the years. So, you know, we want, we want to encourage that. We want to encourage that healthy eating. And then if you still have some, some food left and you don't know what to do, perhaps you can donate to a local food pantry. You know, I'm not exactly sure what the requirements are, but um, I did put a website, ampleharvest.org. So you can always check them out, um, you know, to see if, you know, or, and again, that's just one resource Maybe you have another resource that you're aware of, but there's lots of things that you can do with your with your um, your harvest from your gardens. Okay, let me move myself. I'm kind of blocking. Okay, um, so let's talk about cut and come again. Okay, and I'm talking when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about our leafy vegetables, right? Um, so when you're trying to harvest your lettuce, don't pull out the whole entire lettuce plant. What you're going to do is you're going to twist the leaves off, leave the roots in the ground. Leaves will grow back and you will get more lettuce. As far as um, spinach, kale and chard, chard you're going to um, cut them. You're not going to twist them off. You're gonna cut them with scissors, but again, leave the roots in the ground. More will grow after it. Okay, and then after you're done, after you know it's your last harvest, you've you know you've gone back to your lettuce a few times, twisted it off, and had some lettuce. When you're done, you know it's your last time that you're going to um, harvest it. What you should do is you should continue to twist off that lettuce. Okay, even if it's the last time, you don't want to pull it out by the root because if you pull it out by the root, your whole all of your lettuce leaves, it's gonna get all of the um, soil on it. It's gonna get dirty and it's gonna get that grit on it. It's really hard to get that gritty, um, that gritty off. You can leave, you can twist it off. If the roots are bothering you after you twist it off, then you can take the roots out. Um, you don't have to though, because if you leave those roots in the ground, they might grow again. I mean, you, you know, I, you're not, you know, I'm not sure, but depending on the type of winter you have, they might grow again, but it's up to you. If you wanna take the roots out, take the roots out. If not, but don't don't yank don't yank those last lettuce leaves out with the roots because you won't be you know they won't it won't be as um won't be as good because of the dirt and the grit on the on the leaves. Okay, when it's time to put the garden to bed for winter, you're going to remove your weeds. You're going to mulch your bed. You're going to use leaves, um, you know, dried leaves. You can use straw. You can use shredded paper even. Um, don't use hay or wood mulch. Um, there's too much nitrogen in that. Plus the hay has seeds in it. And we know what seeds do. The, what they'll do is they'll start to grow. And we don't want to be growing hay in our gardens. We don't want to add any seeds that we don't want in our garden. Um, again, you can leave your leafy roots in the ground over the winter if you want. They might start to grow. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about classroom management in the garden classroom. You know. Just like at any time in your classroom, you need to have a plan, right? Um, so always connect that garden um, visit with the lesson. You know, you know exactly what the children are going to accomplish when they're out in the garden. This is what they're going to do, and let them know that before they even get out there. I would set those expectations in the classroom 
um, before I went to the garden. Okay, boys and girls, today we're going to go to the garden and this is what we're going to do. Um, I would also have a garden routine, just like you have a routine for um, every class and how at the beginning of every class, I would have a garden routine. You know, every time, every time they visit the garden, this is what we do. First, we, you know, and just have a routine and that way the students know what to expect, they know what to do. And when they have those expectations and they're clearly set for them, we have less problems as far as behaviors and those types of things. Um, students who are gardening should at least visit the garden one time a week, if not more. You know, two or three times would be, you know, would be great if you can if you can swing that, but at least one time a week for them to really have that garden experience. We talked about, um, you know, having a plan for them. So here are some do now ideas, you know, assign cross curricular activities, you know, di do different things with them. So they have different um, activities to do. Have them work together in partners. Use journals. You might want to have a gardening journal. Like, so that might be part of their routine where, okay, you know, the first thing I do when I go out to the garden is I open my journal and I write today's date in and I find, you know, and I pick three weeds or, you know, something, whatever whatever your routine is. Um, as far as planting seeds, if it's a day that we're planting seeds out in the garden, I wouldn't try to do that with a whole class of 25 kids. I would put them, I would um, put them in groups and I would work with them probably in small groups to plant those seeds while everyone else was doing something independently. Again, you know, depending on the age, on, the, on your um, students, you know, is what they can do um, independently. Again, um, if you've got young and, you know, if you've got a, a wide variety, maybe you can an older student with a younger student, those are nice partnerships often to do. Um, something else you could do in the garden is a um, scavenger hunt. And here's, an, here's some sample ideas for scavenger hunts. Okay, so you can, you know, pick a vegetable plant to measure and then they can measure. You can see, I'm not going to read this to you, and then you can have some popsicle sticks and I would have a nice supply of popsicle sticks and that way they can um, you know, label different things. You can you know, label the plants you plant, but popsicle sticks are gonna be really helpful to you in your garden. But you can see, here are some ideas. You know, I like the bottom question, what's different in the garden since your last visit? So I have to think back to what it looked like last time. Um, there's measuring with the rain gauge, there's looking for creatures, looking at different plants. So it gives students a lot of different things to focus on. Um, so that's just an, uh, an idea for a garden scavenger hunt. And again, this is something that can be reused, you know, maybe they do a scavenger hunt, you know, each time, it's up to you. Um, but really it's important, like all eyes on deck in the garden, it's so important. You want the children out there, you want them out walking around, looking at the plants and paying attention to what's happening in the garden. You want them to let you know if they see that some plants are dying. You know, you know they can, you know, look at, you know, they, they can look at these plants, they can help you um, identify a problem before it becomes a catastrophe, before you're, you know, the, the you know, you're, before everything is eaten by, you know, I don't know, some, an insect or is that some sort of disease. So you really wanna make sure that everyone's looking all of the time. And that's why I think that scavenger hunt idea is a great one because that gets the kids looking at things and it gives them something to look for, but they might see some other things while they're looking. So again, they can look for, you know, eggs on the undersides of leaves, you know, leaves that look all chewed up. If they see leaves that are all chewed up, they should let you know. Yellow spots, um, you know, those types of things. They can let you know those things so you can take care of them. And then as far as, you know, when you find something in your garden and you're like, well, what's, what's that? I'm not sure what that is. You know, there's lots of different apps that you can use. I know I have an app on my phone that helps me not only identify plants um, that I don't know, but it also, if a plant has got a disease or it's got something on it, I can take a picture of it and will tell me, you know, what it, you know, what it is and, you know, how I can remediate it or if I can remediate it. Sometimes you're not able to. Um, some of those plant, some of those um, apps do cost money, um, but check out the one I just found out was called um, Google Lens. So that's a free one through Google. It's a Google app, and uh, you take a picture and it tells you what it is. So maybe that might help you. Um, if you have something and you're not sure, 
You can always email me. I'd be happy to try to help you figure out what it is. If you can send me a picture, pictures are usually the best way to um, be able to identify a problem or what it is, what's, you know, what a plant is, or, you know, you know, what is this on my plant or so um, taking a picture and sending me a picture would be, um, I'd be happy to try to help you troubleshoot what your problem is. Um, these are the common garden problems, insects, too much or not enough water and weeds. Those are the three, the three biggies. Um, so if you can control, you know, you can control those things, um, then you'll be, you'll be in good shape. You know, water is an easy one, I think, to control weeds. I always think every year in, in, in um, April, I say, oh, I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna be on top of it this year, but um, weeds can be tough. So you really have to stay on top of them. And insects are another troubling, something that's really troubling too, because um, you know, it's hard with insects. You know, is it a good insect? Is it a bad insect? What is it doing? So, um, but those are the three big garden problems, three things to, to look out for. Okay. I don't know where I move myself, I'm in the way, okay. Common pitfalls of gardening. These are the things, the, the traps that we fall into and that make us think that we can't garden. Um, you know, make sure you're planting during the right weather. You don't wanna plant, a, you know, your, your warm um, crop plants, you don't wanna plant them in May. You can't, I mean, in early May, it's too early for them, right? So you've gotta make sure you're planting when they're supposed to be planted. Same goes for a cool, a cold, um, a cool weather plant. I can't plant lettuce in July. It's too hot, the lettuce won't grow. Um, the next one says, don't overplant. Again, plants need a certain amount of room to grow. With the exception of some of those leafy um, vegetables that I was talking about, the spinach and the um, lettuce and those, those leafy greens, really make sure you're following those directions and you're giving your plants the space that they need. If they don't have enough room, they're not going to grow to their fullest potential. You won't get, you, you know, they'll be, they'll be um, I don't know, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for, but they'll be smaller than what they should be. They need that room, they need that space to grow. You gotta make sure you're keeping your soil healthy. Mulch helps us keep that soil healthy. Um, also, when we um, do our composting um, workshop, we'll learn more about keeping soil healthy. Proper watering, that's the number one um, killer of plants, either too much or too little water. So be careful with the um, proper watering and you have to pay attention. And paying attention to um, things that are going wrong um, or you know, just these little things before they become big things. It doesn't look like much. And then all of a sudden it's something huge. So you have to pay attention and your kids can help you pay attention to some of those things if we train them the right way to do so. So that's all I have for now. Um, you know, if you have any questions, you can contact me at any time. Um, here's my contact information. I've got my email addresses right there, learnthroughgardening at gmail.com. I will let you know that that's going to be changing soon, I think. So um, I will let you know just as soon as that does change. My cell number is right there. Um, you can call me, you can text me. Probably a text before you call would be good. That way I know who it is. I might not answer if I don't recognize your number, but you know, you can call, you can text, and um, I'd be happy to help you um, answer, answer any questions you have or um, help you out in any way that I can. So um, I'm gonna stop my sharing my screen. So it was nice to be able to spend some time with you to talk to you a little bit about um, gardening and um, gardening basics. If you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, and uh, happy gardening. And I look forward to um, working with everyone. Have a great day.